This is Wes Anderson from In the Shed with Wes Anderson, and you are listening to the Bigfoot Club podcast. Hey, guys. Please go to our website at www.bigfootclubpodcast.com. Check out our merch and all episodes. Also, please look for our social media at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Bigfoot Club One. That's Bigfoot Club number one. Also, check out Matt Knapp's Bigfoot Crossroads on YouTube. Check out our new sponsor. For your Bigfoot size coffee cravings, visit cbgindustries.store. They have over 40 products to choose from. When you enter promo code first sip, you will receive a discount on your first order. Remember, every moment has its flavor. Hey everybody, Robert Jesse Dominguez, Bigfoot Club, Season 5, Episode 9. I'm here with my nephew, Steven. Steven, say what's up. What is up? What's going on, man? We haven't, we haven't done a show in a while. Uh, it's, it's, it's going. I mean, <laughs> we didn't do one last week, did we? We did one last week, but it didn't, oh. it didn't come out good. So Yes. So, yeah, no, we have not done a show in a while. <laughs> so, so, how you been? I've been good. I've been good. I've been, I uh, got the new job. Been there almost a month now. Mm-hmm. I'm getting, you know, trained. Mm-hmm. Why did I say it like that? Trained. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Anyway. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going good. And, um, are you, are you streaming right now? Are you, are you still streaming? Uh, well, I'm not streaming right now. Well, no, I'm, I'm big, I'm big for clubbing right now. <laughs> um, no, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I plan on streaming, uh, sometime next week. My, Street stream anniversary mm-hmm. is next Wednesday. Oh, that's right. Uh, it's my little, I guess, my event, special event that I've been streaming on Twitch for about a year. And hopefully uh, Final Fantasy 16 comes out so I can play it. If not, we'll find something else. But, but yeah. Wow. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, I've been doing it for a year now. It's, it doesn't seem like a year. Right? I, it does not. It really <laughs> doesn't. I feel like I started this year, but I was like, oh, dang. <laughs> was it last year? Ooh. Man, I yeah. think I think I've been on like like the majority of them. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Um, today I'm pretty excited. Mm-hmm. We have in our midst Buck Buckingham from Australian Yowie Research. Buck, welcome to the club. Hey guys, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I want to say like whenever um, we were talking off show and I was telling you that Sarah Bicknall says that you're a lovely man and I need to have you on the show. So, <laughs> you know, we kind of got you on. So, cause like, uh, earlier last year we did, uh, was it last year? It was last year. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We did, we did a, a Australian run where we, we did like six Australian people. So six weeks in a row. Yeah. yeah so it, was it was great. A it was tour great. of Australia without being in Australia. <laughs> it was weird. Um, but yeah, no, um, I think, yeah, you did say, like, I'm trying to get Buck on here, and it was just, yeah. Buck. I think it was bad timing or something. Yeah. Buck, is that is that your real name? It Buck? probably was. Yeah, that's it to you guys. Only my mother calls me Bob by birth name, so unless you want to sound like an 80-year-old woman, <laughs> just keep calling me Buck. <laughs> I was going to say that there's there's a lyric on... on um, Jump! Uh, what's what's the uh, name? House of Pain. House of Pain. Uh-huh. There's a lyric on House of Pain. Every time uh-huh. I someone mentions your name, I think about you, and it goes, it goes something like this. Hold on, I'm trying to find it real quick. It's up, up, and around. Then buck, buck you down. I'm coming to get you. <laughs> so every time, every time someone says buck, buck in it, I think about that lyric. Buck, 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 buck you down. He's been saying it to me too. He's been like, "Hey, we're gonna have buck uh, this Friday." I go, uh, "Buck, buck you down." Yeah, buck, buck you down. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you. <laughs> oh, Buck. Um, so how how long have you been with uh, Australian Yowie Research? Um, I've been uh, in the mix since 2005 when I first met Dean. You've probably heard um, Dean, very yeah. glowing appraisals of Dean, and I will just add to that. He's a very, very tireless and generous soul that kicked off Australian Yo research um, when he had a couple of encounters that didn't fit within the normal paradigm of his worldview. Certainly it was upended and he wanted answers and no one could give answers. So he set about uh, making this repository, uh, the Yowie Research uh, Forum, mm-hmm. 
for all these encounters and uh, resources that uh, people who need answers or want to go and do research can go to. So it's a massive, massive trove of information, all free. He doesn't ask anything in return, you know, just maybe participation. And so that's how I got involved. I had a couple of experiences when I was younger and as I mulled over them, I came across his page and it uh, piqued my curiosity to the back uh, when I was young and I went, now this makes sense. So I got involved. I went with him on a trip called uh, Tablelands Road and that's in uh, New South Wales. It's about 70 k's out of Sydney. It's in a place called Kutuba in the... um, in the Megalong Valley, it's an ancient, arcane valley um, that is a heritage listed. It has the Three Sisters, which are these big rock uh, monoliths that just rise out of the valley. And there had been an encounter there that it uh, uh, caught my attention. And so this was my first trip out. I decided I'll go by myself. So I went by myself to this road just to get a view of... Um, this encounter and start getting into it again, reflecting back on my childhood experiences. And then a week later, Dean put a question out on the forum saying, hey, does anybody want to go to Tablelands Road? And I immediately put my hand up for the assignment because I'd just been there and we've been fast friends ever since. So back in 2005 and it ebbs and wanes just with life's commitments, work, um, cities when you move and change uh, work in cities. But uh, it's been very, very positive. And um, so I've been, I guess, what is it? It's nearly 17 years. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I hear I hear a lot of good things about Dean. I, I've never talked to him. I've never met him. I've never emailed him or anything like that, but I've heard a lot of good stuff from, you know, from you, Gary Lynn, uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> Yowie Dan, you know, Sarah Bignall, uh, you know, I hear lot, lots of good things about him. And that's, that's good to have a great leader uh, with us, uh, you know, Australian Yowie research. So, mm-hmm. but um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, cause I know, you know, I knew a little bit about Australian Yowie Research. Uh, I was introduced to that with Rex Gilroy. I know he just passed away recently, right? Yeah, he did like two weeks ago. Wow, because like, in like in the late nineties, yeah. in the late nineties, he he we would email each other, and so I kind of got familiar mm-hmm. with uh, Yow- Yowie Research, and then I heard you know Dean's name, and but you you were a part of an amazing thermal footage that I, I even to this day I look at it myself. And I just find it, it's amazing. It was in uh, Springbrook National Park, right? That's right. Uh, we just went up there last weekend. In fact, a week ago today, we were up there, but not at uh, Stickland Track. Wow. Uh, we're in another part of Springbrook. But uh, honestly, I look back at that uh, footage with great wonder and, uh, you know, a massive amount of questions about the whole evening and night, you know, we, you know, that's, that was at the end of nearly 15 years of being involved mm-hmm. with the research. And uh, that was the biggest thing that had ever happened. Uh, a lot of encounters and things and high strangeness occur from time to time, but there's also great deserts of nothing. And I'm sure that you guys will attest to that. You can go out Mm -hmm. as many times as you like and it'll be the same old, same old, just crickets or nothing. And suddenly it's active and very, you're very busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I hope I get another chance to have that intersect again you know, in your life when you're present and something else is there at the same time. Whereas in the past, we've been chasing um, reports of uh, the Yowie, the hairy man, and going to the sites long after the the fact that it had happened. But this was very different this night. This night it was active and Dean and Gary had put in the hard yards and found this 
uh, active area of this trail, which we call Stickland, because of all the sticks that are left there, all these amazing glyphs, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to which I hadn't paid much attention to because I know what deadfall is and I know that the bush is a strange place. Uh, but when it was pointed out to me by Gary and Dean, I started to notice it, and particularly around the camp area where we were, it was quite prevalent. And the I don't know if you know that the end result of the, the thermal cap, uh, capture was in the morning afterwards, there were these massive sticks jammed in the road on our exit, mm-hmm. you know, uh, as some type of statement, some type of communication, I didn't ever feel threatened, but that was the icing on the cake is uh, this small X marker, maybe about two feet, mm-hmm. um, placed by the log where I'd been standing most of the night and I'd got their footage. And there's a big foot impression in there and it's about a, an inch and a half, two inches deep as whatever it was that stooped over and put a little X marker by the log. And then these weird collection of sticks jammed in the road on the rise of the hill, like the summit, which mm-hmm. was where we were. And um, when we came up the hill in the evening, I'd never been to this place. Uh, I'd heard that we were going to research a new area, that they found an area that they thought was hot. And because it was, you know, April and getting towards autumn, the sun was sitting a bit lower. So when I got to this area, it was completely dark. There was 5% moon and the glowworms were out, so I didn't sight this place during the day. But what I did notice when I got up to the top of the hill where this log was, was there was an open opening in the canopy, which is um, very pertinent because people go, oh, you know, the sticks just fell there, and I'm going... From where? There's no trees above this for it to fall directly down and spear into the ground. And one of them was this weird shaped stick that looked like a backwards four. It, it, it's not natural. And also, there were three sticks jammed in the ground and a, a weird kind of triangle glyph on the ground and an X marker. That just does not happen like that it just doesn't and uh, so that was that was really electrifying the next day because uh, we knew that we had been observed we'd been noted and they let me know let us know that they knew where we were um, despite the fact of having a thermal camera so the thermals were something else like I had used a FLIR before Mm-hmm. Um, Dean had graciously bought a floor in the early 2000s and um, lent it to the research group in Sydney and we just caned it. We thrashed that unit and he didn't even get to use it for nearly eight to ten months. He bought a brand new camera, let us use it and then he said, oh, I have my camera, I want to do something. So we were still using that unit and it uh, had failed at a critical point when we were researching another area called Bellberg Grove. Um, He'd bought one brand new guide IR50, which is a new thermal unit, uh, which is cheaper than the FLIR and it had obviously superseded the type of technology that the FLIR we had that was made in the 2000s. Anyway, he'd uh, got a visual on it a target that was coming up the hill to in the area of this really incredible daylight encounter, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And the the dam unit wouldn't uh, film. It only got one uh, really bad still uh, because it was on its way out. So Dean said about buying more units. And on the night of the thermal capture, um, he had had two of these units and I had one. And um, they, we'd made camp, we'd set up a small fire, put the white light around the camp area because we 
tend to have a routine which is we don't use torch lights out beyond the scope of the camp because camp is camp and it looks normal. But when we go out, we either use nothing, which I prefer to do, or really low um, red light. And some of the guys have red lights on their head, and I'm I'm a bit more cautious. I have a little torch which I have in my hand, and that's lower, so that's down by my knee, so it doesn't give my position away as much. And I'll only turn it on a few times. Uh, a night if I think I'm going to trip and fall. Um, so I, I just won't use light when I'm out there. I'll use a thermal, and then I get a terrible case of hot eye. If you guys ever used a thermal, you know that one eye goes completely blind from uh, looking at it through the um, monitor. And when you take your, the the monocular away from your eye you've got one eye that just can't see anything and one eye that's struggling to see in the dark it's very unnerving so i grabbed that uh second unit gary gave me a brief tutorial i knew my way around the floor but not my way around the guide ir50 and so dean was playing classical music i think he was playing playing gary hates it gary's a metalhead yeah yeah, gary absolutely (laughs) loves metal so dean was playing yo-yo mars buck cello suite number five or something <laughs> and it's it's a beautiful piece yeah unless you ask gary yeah and so I, I drifted off into the dark with that in the background and i went maybe 70 meters 200 feet a bit more up to the crest of the hill where we had first arrived in the evening and i just started to work the track which is a fire trail i was looking for heat signatures and i settled on this odd heat signature that was up in a tree i'd say maybe 15 feet off the ground it was hard to tell but it wasn't behaving normally and it looked like something was peeking around the um well, I'm talking to you. I might even just send this to you. I don't know if you can see it. But it looked like it was peeking around the uh, trunk of the tree. Mm-hmm. And I um, was going, this is odd. It also looked like there were two heat signatures that were uh, below the main uh, heat signature, which I interpreted to be a head, and it looked like an ancient head briefly, like the there are leaves and there are things in front of your uh, unit. And so you're not always getting direct line of sight. Like, um, hang on. I'll send you this image, which is the, um, which is, you've probably seen already. This is just the. Yeah, Gary, uh, Gary showed us some of the, some of the footage and he showed us. Uh, yeah, some this of, is, of you know, the- amazing. So, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I'll post this on uh, on the page. But um, do you think that these Yahweh's were attracted to the classical music? I think they were attracted to the activity. One thing is for absolute certain is that this area isn't frequented um, by people, many people, if any, let alone people camping out. At night there, it's not a beauty spot. There are no waterfalls. There's nothing of interest to hold a human there. There really isn't. So uh, when you get to this area, whatever attracts them to this area is known to them. And we're only attracted to that area because we believe they're in that area. That's our only interest. We're not going there for a camp. And we're not going there because it's a beauty spot. We believe that there's something to be got out of that um, region. So I think I wrong-footed them to begin with Mm -hmm. because I know what a thermal unit is. Um, They're used to humans not being able to see in the dark and also they know when humans are moving out 
because they'll have torches. They'll be shining torches, and so that's a dead giveaway. If there's no torches being shone around in the bush, uh, it's safe to say that all attendees at that area will be within that area. So I'd slunk off with this um, new unit, and um, I'd seen what I thought was this head peeking around the um, corner of a tree and uh, what I thought were hands, but it wasn't clear at that point because it was so fleeting. So I said to the boys, hey, I've got something, I'm coming back, I want you to check it out. And that was a complete lie because I just worked that, excuse me, I just worked that trail for another 20 minutes because I thought, don't go back, um, just keep going, maybe maybe it'll appear again. And, um, you know, when you use a thermal unit, you're on uh, because uh, it's unmistakable when you get a live creature in, in your screen, it glows. It's, it's super hot. It's not a rock. It's not a tree. It's not latent heat hidden in something else. It's um, a living, breathing creature. So the first thing I had, which I assumed to be this head, I was searching for again, and uh, I was making my way back, and I thought I saw a similar thing again. And uh, so I tried to zoom in, and then I noticed this stump, and this stump had this incredible um, action going on it or in it. It looked like these giant eyes peering around it, above it. I couldn't figure it out. Maybe an arm, couldn't tell. I'm also looking at it in real time through a tiny um, viewfinder. Mm. So you don't have the luxury of examining what you see in real time. It's only after it happens that you kind of get the idea of, um, you know, what you were looking at. And so... I'm going, hey, I'm on this stump. Something's going on around here. I'm going to try and zoom in. And I tried to remember what Gary had said. These um, new units, which I'm familiar with now, have a number of buttons. And the buttons also have different assignments. And if you don't press them in the right order, you can screw yourself up, which is what happened. I zoomed in, stopped filming and zoomed in and got this... Uh, I wanted to get the stump. Now I can't find the stump at all. So I've got a 20-minute clip, uh, some stump action going on, which I feel is close to me, maybe, I don't know, 10 metres, 30 metres off the track. The the bush is very thick. As soon as you get off this man-made track, it's thick, and there are these vicious vines called waiter wilds that just snag you and trip you up, and they've got needle-like... Um, hooks and barbs on them. And so you can't wander off too much in the dark or you'll just um, do yourself a mischief. So I had found that stump. Now I've lost the stump because I've narrowed my field of view. And I'm looking left, I'm looking right. I see a couple of heat images and they look like the hand-type signals, uh, signatures I saw before. Then lo and behold... In this clip, which is about minute 19, um, this in the final few seconds of this clip, as I'm searching for the stump, stump, these two massive units of a one walks out and bends down and picks something. I radio Gary because Gary's got my six. He's a good guy, Jason Momoa. (laughs) And um, (laughs) because he does look like an apple man. He he does. We, We told him that too. So. Yeah, <laughs> he looks like Aquaman on a hard day. He, looks, he also um, looks like uh, Cal Drogo from uh, Game of Thrones too. So it's the same guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he does. And and he's a big man. He's a solid unit. So you want him in your corner. Anyway, so he's got my six. He's actually got footage of me uh, filming them at the same time he's filming mm-hmm. me, and. Because uh, I'd asked him, I said, hey, if you get me, can you get another side so we can get corroborating evidence? And 
you know, get another angle on it. Um, also, I knew something was happening. Anyway, so one steps out and it bends down and picks something off the ground twice. I don't know what it's doing, what it's picking up, and it hands it to another creature beside it. And you can really only see the shoulders and part of the head on the side. But we've always been told that they travel in pairs and um, this certainly fit the brief. And uh, Gary said, do you want me to come up? And as soon as he spoke and moved away uh, from the camp, uh, I had decided at that point erroneously to try and zoom out because I felt I was losing the picture Mm -hmm. because it was so uh, close. The early part of the footage is very shaky as I'm trying to steady my hands uh, search around for the heat signature and I get something completely different. Um, I decide I'm, I think I'm going to lose the shot because I now know where they are and I think they're going to bolt. So I stop filming to zoom out. Uh, and in that time, all I've done is um, just cascade. You may have seen that footage where I'm just going through all these filters, these mm. different colours. I've seen it. And... Yeah, so that provides more information, but it was also operator error. Um, oh, well, Sam, how tall do you think they were? At that point, I had no idea because I had no scale to measure them against. Um, earlier on, when I saw something uh, at the beginning of the trail, I thought it was tall because of the way my uh, head was tilted to look up a bit through the um, viewfinder. So I was thinking, oh, my neck's cripped up a little. It's got to be tall. I know the ground's going up from me. But when um, the boys found the um, site, um, we didn't find it the next day. We had to bunk out very quickly. Uh, We looked around and there were three stumps behind a camp to choose from. I'm going, which one's which? Where was I standing exactly and how did I get this perfect shot through a window of branches and leaves? And we settled on this one that fit the bill and it would put them between 9 and 10 foot, which is astounding. I have no idea that they may be that tall. That is tall. That's what, Uh, 2.75 metres? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and even allowing for error, if you go, okay, they're eight foot tall. They're tall. They're not. I can tell you, they're not six foot, right. because you wouldn't have seen them uh, come over the uh, top of this tree, which is kind of like called soya grass or soya palm. And um, if they were Gary's height, Gary's six foot. He's a solid six foot. Uh, he would have been hidden. So they were taller than that, way taller than that. Um, so, you know, anywhere between 8 and 10 foot um, That's amazing. is a reasonable uh, estimation. And it also fits in with eyewitness accounts in that area. That whole area is hot for accounts, not just by researchers, but just general, general folk going about their business and then having a life altering encounter. Um, one of them is uh, this truck driver uh, who uh, was just rolling slowly back down the hill after delivering a truckload of bluestone to a monastery uh, uh, for a driveway up at um, Witherham. And as he's coming around the corner, he's going slow. He sees what he thought was a big rock rolling down uh, the side of this embankment, and it kind of lands in a Superman pose in the middle of the road, stands up, and it's 10 foot. It's eyeballing him in the truck. And so Glenn is absolutely thunderstruck by this imma- immense creature that's shunted the front of, put its arm out and angrily palm the front of the truck as Glenn has locked up the brakes. And it grunts at him and just lopes off uh, into the bush on the other side. Now, that seems to fit um, the bill of a 
a local that the residents call Big Red. Mm. And uh, Big Red uh, is just this term for what we believe is uh, a local Yawi or Bigfoot that lives in that area. So Big Red is roughly 10 foot. And um, the shape and the outline of the creature that I got seems to show it's uh, Big Red and plus one. In my opinion, wow. you know, that's just an opinion. I don't know if it's the same individual, but it's tall. Big, and um, Big Red sounds like a character. The, <laughs> yeah, Big Red sounds like a character. I'll send you. Um, um, I do illustrations for the eyewitness um, audio reports. Oh, that's awesome. And so that's the other thing I do is um, I help augment um, uh, the real voices of eyewitnesses. Uh, in uh, the uh, Australian Yowie Research uh, YouTube channel where you can see uh, an illustrated version of the surrounding areas with maps uh, accompanied by illustrations by me, footage by Dean, and the voice of the witness that puts you in the driver's seat. But So we, we actually met Glenn, uh, the truckie, and he took us through the encounter and he had half a dozen cigarettes all smoked at the at his feet. He was just nervously chain smoking and in complete uh, kind of PSTD mode. Poor guy. From this encounter. Yeah. So he kind of reached out and he got some type of relief when people took him seriously. Yeah. And now he's quite happy to wear that badge. So, so we think maybe ten foot. So this Yowie rode down a hill, did a Superman pose, got up and stuck his hand out to stop the truck. Well, he was already braking. He think that right, 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 right. Uh, we think that <laughs> we think that what happened was he may have been going to cross, and the uh, embankment is shallow and there's some loose rocks, and maybe it slipped, and uh, then just jumped on the road. It was definitely going to go and cross there. Right. Uh, at the same time the truck came and when, as Glenn puts it, uh, he hit the brakes, it screeched and it surprised the creature who got a fright, looked embarrassed and then got angry. And then as the truck had pulled up, he pushed his hand up as the truck had stopped and uh, he said he could feel the strength of this creature just rock the truck. Uh, so he didn't stop the truck like Superman. Right, he right. It just so happened as the truck screeched to a halt in front of him, the um, uh, it shunted the truck angrily, like, back off. And uh, the sad thing was is that Glenn's actual truck was in for a service that day, and on that truck was a uh, dash cam. Oh, no. Be, oh, no. I know. <laughs> Oh, it's such a well-worn story, that story. <laughs> oh, it man. is such a well-worn story going, oh, my God, if only I had a That would have been interesting. That would have been. That- yeah, I, Australian Yowie, like, eyewitness stuff, is they have some of the strangest and interesting stories. Mm-hmm. I, that's what I've, you know, hearing stories from Gary, hearing stories from Sarah. Was and- it Gary that had the interesting one where yeah. it was someone going down, down a road and – they almost ran over a Bigfoot baby. A, a Yowie. A, yeah, oh, yeah. Yowie. Yeah, that's, and, that's uh, one of our researchers. That's yeah. Shannon. Yeah, and, and then... Uh, with Shannon and Gary. Yeah. The next day, he went down the same same road, and it was the parent, and it was screaming like... Oh, it, it, it took a swing at the... It took a swing at the car. Uh-huh. Because, like, the, like the day before... She almost hit a Yowie, a smaller one, mm-hmm. and then she went down the same road again and waited. And, and there yeah. was a, there was a parent or a bigger Yowie took mm-hmm. a swing at her car, mm-hmm. like this, almost saying, "Don't hit my, don't come this way and hit my kid again." Don't and, don't look, look both ways <laughs> across the street. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, you know, even like Rex Giro, I used to he used to email me strange stories of like Yowies trying to like try to coach people. Like there was this guy on a on horseback. And he saw a Yowie, and I, I forgot what, it was probably like in the 30s or something. And this Yowie yeah. was like waving to him to come, like to follow him. And mm. I thought that was one of the strangest stories I've ever heard. That's, like, that's creepy. It is creepy, but. Um, I'd be like pushing yeah. pushing away. No, 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 no
that, you know, um, I would go. I would definitely go to meet my maker. <laughs> um, I would look behind me and point at me like, me? Me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I mean, it's, you know, we're out there to do a job, so... Um, and the job is fueled by our own curiosity. There's no money in it. There's mm. very little fame in it. Um, there's just a driving curiosity to have an answer. Right. Uh, to I like that about um, you. Yeah. And um, uh, the one uh, where Shannon almost hit the kid is, is fascinating because he lives on that range where these creatures have been sighted, and he was with me on the night to earn Gary. Uh, Shannon was the fourth member of the team at the night we got the thermals. And you can see him in the video footage when it finally pops out. He goes, that's clear as day. You know, he's Mm -hmm. just astounded. Anyway, he uh, was going in early one morning and he and Gary ride motorbikes very, very, very fast. And he came around the corner and he just came up on what he thought was a five-year-old boy covered in fur. And he thought he, he was bracing for impact and trying to um, come around on the inside of uh, this creature. And he, you can just remember seeing this calloused hand uh, bracing for impact and the hand just hit the uh, top of his boot as he went on the inside and, you know, um, uh, trailed off the back of his bike. So it was a very narrow escape. And as Shannon put, like Shannon was shaking, uh, he wasn't hanging around uh, to speak to mum and dad. And um, uh, it was, it was, I illustrated that one and that was one of the best ones uh, the, the most enjoyable ones I've done because I got to speak to Shannon and I know Shannon very well through Gary mm. and he's a lovely bloke. But the curious thing is um, we went there to get some drone footage, interview Shannon by the side of the road to, uh, where it happened and we also went down into the scrub. Now this, uh, I'd say the side of this mountain, it would be you know, around 50, 60 degrees um, uh, in its slope. It's a steep slope. Um, and we, you have to track along the slope, slide, you know, go down on an angle. If you go straight down, you'll just fall down. So you have to pick your way through. Maybe about um, 70 metres below the sighting, Gary found two two prints of which I scanned. I sent you one I got yes. uh, last weekend, yeah. which was riveting because that is just in the wilds. That is in the wilds and this is massive, big heel uh, depressing the grass and this foot going into um, the soft dirt. It's been raining a lot around here, so if there was going to be a time to get prints, that was it. So I got one last weekend, uh, but I've got... Uh, two 3D scans of these footprints. One is a big one and one is a small one and that was right below uh, Shannon's sighting. So it fits the bill. No one's sending their kids um, over the side of these mountains where snakes and uh, thorns are with no shoes on. So uh, you have to be in the right place in the right time. And usually the, the place is they're crossing a road. That's usually it. They're crossing the road or you're camping, you know. So uh, I was very pleased to be involved in uh, helping document that one. But the um, the when the creatures left that night, when I had stopped filming and Gary came up, they literally looked in his direction and they took off and they were so quiet. I, you know, it was... They didn't evaporate. They moved off, and they moved off very quickly. Quietly? But quietly. No sound. Wow. That's scary. Absolutely no sound. That's scary. Um, yeah, it was absolutely fascinating because we went uh, in the daylight. We could get a better appraisal of what was going on back there. There was some 
open areas where there's a, a lot of softer grass, so they could have walked on that, which also means that they are masters of their environment and they've chosen, we'll come this way because it'll make less noise. But um, I've seen Dean and Gary uh, return from the same area uh, after trying to find a uh, audio recorder that they'd left there for a couple of weeks and the amount of noise those guys made um, while they were trying to move quietly, you know, they were just like a couple of bulls um, crashing through the, the desert and they were, uh, through the brush. They were trying to be quiet. So to not hear those creatures leave um, was amazing. It, it was astounding. So I took it back uh, to the camp. Gary fired up the Wi-Fi on the unit and then uh, cast the footage to his phone and that was it. It was uh, there for everyone to see and I was astounded too because I was looking at it for a second time uh, on a, a much bigger device. You know, a phone is much bigger than the monitor that you're looking through and all this other detail came out um, and even... Uh, last year I plumbed the footage a bit more and I put it on a loop and I found that it seems as though they, they tossed something out. Um, either it was a small creature that they had frightened, it goes in a bit of an arc and then down to the area where one of the creatures bends down and picks it up or they flick something and it's bounced off a tree or a branch and boomerang back. But um, it was it's the slightest uh, bit of heat, but it's there, uh, you know, it's just more information to be extracted. But it took a year for that to be noticed because we're all focused on when they step out. This is mm-hmm. just before they step out. That's understandable. And everybody, yeah. So maybe they were planning to chuck something in the direction of camp because it was in the direction of camp. Yeah. But what it was, I don't know. That's amazing. Hey, hey, uh, Buck, I, I had a question for you. Yeah. You were on uh, Attila's track in the lore, were you? Yes, I was. And could you, like, I guess, expand on that or, like, talk yeah. talk, talk about that? Yeah, how was that? How was that, being on TV? Ooh. Being famous oh, on TV? Oh, it was, <laughs> it was great. It was great to be a part of it, you know. I'm a big fan of a lot of stuff that comes out of the States. I really like the 411 yes. documentaries that come out. So to be part of something similar in Australia was, you know, just a huge honour. But I was also very lucky. Um, I could have had the unit facing the other way down the hill mm. uh, on the other side of the track and not seen anything, and this conversation wouldn't be taking place. So I was really happy to be part of it. Um, and I also know how long... Uh, 15 years is to get something like that. It's a long time it is. to get anything of any significance. That is not, I went out once and I got this. I've been out heaps of times, scores of times, come back with tick bites and leech bites and, you know. Um, so when I was on Attila, I was tracking the law, explaining it, I'd uh, seen Attila's first a documentary I'd known uh, Yowie Dan because um, I went to a Yowie symposium, a town hall meeting in a place called Nana Glen, which is in northern New South Wales, and it's where Russell Crowe has his um, oh. farm and family okay. house down there. Nice. So I'd met uh, Yowie Dan there and met some other people, um, and uh, I knew of Attila's work, so I got, got to meet them. And then we got to take them uh, to the area oh. that evening. Uh, we got rained out, unfortunately. Massive storm was coming through. We are going to spend all night there. But up in the hinterland, uh, if it's going to rain, it rain, It flogs down. It absolutely pelts down and it's miserable. You might as well uh, cut your losses and go rather than just face eight hours of torrential rain. Yeah. and get all your gear wet. So unfortunately, the weather was just too horrible for us to do the full overnighter. So we left maybe, I don't know, 
one o'clock mm-hmm. and got back. But Attila was wonderful. And Yari Dan's just great. He's a real character. I love them both. Uh, yeah, 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 they're yeah, absolutely Yowie, solid. Yaoi Dan messages me every day. Every day. Yeah, he does it. He, yeah, he's, he, he, he's prolific. Yeah. He, say, he sends me pictures of, of his garden, and he tries to find spiders there. And he'll tell me, I am, I'm looking for spiders. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. And then, and then we he's, get lots of spiders. We've got yeah. massive spiders here. And, then, and deadly spiders. That will, yeah, that's what that's Take what he says, and uh, he sends me pictures of thongs. <laughs> thongs, yeah, he loves thongs. His hiking thongs, his sleeping thongs, yeah. his wedding thongs. He just um, loves that gear. Buck, I was going to ask you because uh, I I've done this like whenever I've done Bigfoot research in East Texas, uh, I yeah. always I always come across whenever I'm looking for Bigfoot, I always come across something paranormal all the time. Do you you yeah. ever experience that like in the woods or the the bush? Have you experienced some stuff that you can't explain, or something that's odd? Well, yeah, there's a term high strangeness which I like, and it seems to fit this. Um, there are times where um, I think Gary uh, gets it more because he's more open to it. I tend to. All right, I, I can only deal with something that's flesh and blood, mm. and other people tend to want to be exposed to more of that. I had some paranormal experiences when I was younger, and I didn't like that, so I've shut myself off from it. Mm-hmm. But um, out in the bush, uh, you would know this instantly. I'm sure you guys have keen eyes. Uh, you'll know when something's off, and mm-hmm. you'll know when um, something doesn't fit the the narrative of the bush, you go that that branch is not right, or you know trees don't break like that. That's not dead fall. That coyote didn't hang itself up in the tree. Mm-hmm. You know that type of thing. Um, recently, I wasn't there, but they found a massive gut pile up at Stick Stickland. And while we do have hunters in Australia, we don't have the same type of hunting community en masse that you might have in the States. So if people go out and they hunt and dress an animal uh, in the States, people will know what they do if they're going to skin a deer and they'll put it on a tree. But this was up at Stickland. There's nothing to hunt up there. There's zero. I know we have some feral deer, but no one's going up there with guns on the off chance they might get one feral deer and we don't know what the gut pile was, but Wade and uh, Dean had found this massive gut pile that you would have had to put in an, a wheelbarrow to cart up there to get rid of, but there was no blood around. So they couldn't find the site of uh, an animal that uh, had been slaughtered or attacked there. So uh, I wasn't there for that, but I, that set alarm bells. Uh, I was going, wow, that is, that is odd. high strangeness. I have been out by myself uh, at night and um, the, when I was young, this is, this is how I got into it. When I was young, I was trying to impress a girl by getting muscles, so I thought I'd do it by running, which doesn't work. It just makes you leaner, <laughs> and I was pretty lean. Okay. So I would run up. Uh, this road called Samson Vale Road and pass a dam called North Pine Dam or Lake Samson Vale. And there's a cove called Forgan Cove. And so my run would consist of maybe half road running that uh, went around the perimeter of the dam. Then I'd go cross country uh, through bush and then along a creek and then come up on a dirt road that would lead me back to uh, my house. And I would say this would be about five mile, you know, roughly eight to ten kilometre run um, when I was younger and fitter. Anyway, one night when I went out, um, I turned right into uh, Forgan Cove and I felt like something was shadowing me, like there was solid thumps and I was going, is this my footsteps coming back over the water? Am I hearing a reflection uh, due to some sound anomaly? 
anyway, so I'd stopped and then there was a bit of a delay and I went, that was weird. And then I ran again and I thought I heard it again. I thought, I'm going to stop suddenly. So I stopped suddenly and then the gap was too big. It was way too big for it to be my sound. And I just took off up the hill. And for some reason that night, the dogs up at this farmhouse just went ballistic. Uh, I don't know what it was. And I made a record uh, timing getting back home, but I still had to run through bush and I was terrified. And I didn't tell people about that uh, for a long time. Um, Did you feel like nauseated or lightheaded or anything like that? Well, this no, but I will tell you this. I just felt scared and I felt alone. I'm used, uh, used to the bush. I love the bush, but and I don't mind the dark and I don't mind the night. Um, but I didn't feel good. And if you fast forward um, maybe 18 months later, and this is two kilometres down the road, so say a mile down the road around a few bends, there's a place called Bullocky Rest, uh, I haven't told anyone about this, but uh, like at that time, I, I have now, but um, I was in a car with my best friend and he's got his licence, so his sworn duty is to try and kill all, all of us by driving as fast as he can when you get your licence. You're just going to lose all sense of, um, <laughs> you know, decorum and just speed everywhere. So he was uh, driving the car at a mate in the... Uh, front passenger seat and I was in the back of the car with two friends who were sisters and we're all a a group at school and uh, Christian did a U-turn near Bullocky Rest and bear in mind mind, this is about a mile away from my footstep encounter that I didn't know what it was. As the car does a U-turn around on the road, the lights swing out over the dam over the water and I've been along that road so many times got to go to fishing holes that it looked like there's this big old rusty uh termite mound there and it's it was big it was maybe five foot tall and this is what my first impression as the lights went past it the termite mound stood up on two legs and I said what's that and Christian just stopped the car and everybody said, what's what? And then the whole car was filled with this terrible, terrible smell of rotting veg- vegetation, meat. It smelled like a, a rubbish pile. It was nauseating. And, of course, the guys at the front, they were going, oh, who's, who's let one off? Who's broke wind? And something goes behind the car. And this is a little Datsun 120Y. And... The, they have a small window at the back. It's a very sloped window. And something blacks out the window. Something huge goes past the back, the boot of the car. And the girls are now screaming and I'm hitting the headrest, going, drive, drive, drive. And the guys are laughing, going, what, what, what? And one of the girls just shrieks and she then buries her head in her hands on her lap and they take her seriously now and the car just speeds off and um, she's just saying the eyes, the eyes, the eyes. And so at that stage, I still hadn't got a grasp of what it might be. I I thought that was paranormal at that stage. I thought, oh, have we witnessed some type of ghostly haint on the the road? Um, The smell was terrible. It really was, but there was five of us in the car and we all smelt it. Three of us saw something Mm -hmm. and one of us saw more than the others and we couldn't get anything out of her. She would not uh, talk about it. She was so freaked out and shaking that the elder sister said, shut up, leave her alone. And we never got to the bottom of that and it was never spoken about again. But that was one of the things in my um, uh, childhood experiences, uh, my early experiences that I went, wow, uh, when I came across Dean's page, I went, this makes sense, the running, the what I saw. Mm-hmm. And then there's another story from that area, 
and um, I was at my best friend's place and uh, his uh, parents had cooked dinner and so it was our turn to wash up. So I was washing uh, with his brother's girlfriend. So we were doing the dishes and um, his brother's girlfriend turned to me and said, hey, Bob, can I ask you about this? And I said, what? She said, well, my brother and my cousins were camping at Lake Kawangba. And Lake Kawangba is, say, three, four miles away from Lake Samson Vale. And I said, what happened? And she said, well, uh, we were at home and then suddenly they were camping and they were all back at home and um, some of them were crying and some of them were just really upset and agitated and they said that they'd been camping at Lake Kawangba and her brother had gone out to answer the call of nature and as he was, um, you know, just passing water, he looked up and directly in front of him was this pair of red glowing eyes about eight foot off the ground and he walks back virtually through the fire still urinating and this creature follows him to the fire and then everybody just bolts and runs and leaves and as they look back as they're scrambling they just left everything there they see these giant pair of legs going around the fire and so they've now tipped up at their house and they're in a state of agitation and upset and the older brothers and uncles and fathers say we'll go sort this fellow out so they tip up to the camp they get to the camp everything's been flattened the fire's now just coals and there are giant footsteps all around the campfire and um, the tent is just flattened And some of them say, okay, this is amazing what's going on here. These footprints are huge. We're going to come back in the morning and take some plaster casts. When they come back in the morning, the whole place has been swept clean. It's absolutely swept clean. Fire's out. The tent is packed down neatly. And they reason that maybe one of the parents who was with them, has decided, no, this has gone far enough. I don't want any more to do with this. And they've come in and they've cleaned it up. Wow. Um, Yeah, absolutely wow. So these are three stories within five kilometres of where I grew up. Um, And that's how I got hooked into uh, the notion that there's something else out there. There is something else out there. Uh, I don't have to question it. I know there is something else out there, just as you guys would. Um, Trying to prove it uh, to anyone else is almost a fool's game because... I have to agree with you on that. You know, you you go, I can't convince people. Uh, I've shown some nearest and dearest the footage I took of the thermals and I've literally got back, nah, I need more. How much more do you need? I, I find you know? I find it amazing. Whenever I first saw it, that's probably the best thermal footage I've ever seen, ever. Thanks, thanks, man. So it was. But I was um, I was going to tell you we're we're coming up on an hour. That's you. Yeah. Did you do what? How long we go on an hour? So um, I wanted mm-hmm. I wanted to ask if there's anything that you want the listeners, the Bigfoot Club listeners, to. If they want to reach out to you or if you want to, if you're, I don't know if you're doing a book or if you're doing a presentation or if you want people to go out to the uh, Australian Yowie Research website, is there, how, how does one find all that stuff? Okay, I would definitely go out to uh, yowiehunters.com um, and uh, check out the um, amazing, uh, the amazing, stuff that's up there, including the footage that you can mm. uh, discern um, for yourself uh, what's going on there. Uh, there's the, the – we're coming up on so many eyewitness accounts, not people reading accounts, not people um, retelling stories, but the person retelling their story of encounters, which is, you know, first-person information. But in terms of a book – 
Uh, yes, a book's just come out in the last month, and uh, it's called The Yowie File, okay. and it's Encounters with the Australian Ape Men. It's by Tony Healy and Paul Cropper. So definitely go check out The Yowie File because there's a chapter in the back about the spring book encounter, um, and we're all in it. But more importantly, uh, Tony Healy and Paul Cropper, this is their third book. It's a, it's a trilogy of, um, you know, research into the, uh, you know, the hairy men of the bush. But it's uh, peppered with all these amazing articles from uh, colonial Australia, from newspapers and all this incredible information that has been uh, researched thoroughly as well as the stuff uh, the contemporary stuff that Dean has um, uh, afforded them to make this book. And while I didn't do the cover art, I really love the cover art, um, I did get to illustrate the Yahweh File book. So I did about nice. maybe 12, 13 illustrations for historical um, encounters. Uh, so uh, it was nice to be part of that. So that's the Yahweh File. And if you want uh, to improve your collection on uh, hairy hominins, then definitely grab that and put it to your Sasquatch Bigfoot collection. As well as just uh, visit um, the yaoihunters.com um, and just get involved and see. Uh, if you're a serious researcher, you'll, you'll know that um, Bigfoot is not alone. There are cousins, the Yerim, the Elmasti, everything, you know, aren't Orang Pendek, and in Australia we have two types. We have the small one, which is called the Junjidi, which may be Junjidi, about three yeah. to five foot, Junjidi. Yeah. And then the taller ones, like in Australia, it's called Quinkin. But, you know, throughout Indigenous uh, history, you know, there's Dulagal, um, uh, Quinkin, so many different names for these creatures. They all know about them and they've been telling white colonialists for many, many years, don't go there, this will happen, that will happen. Um, pretty much like the American uh, First Nations people will tell you stories about Sasquatch, Bigfoot, mm -hmm. everything. Well, Buck, thank you for coming on. I, I Just so you know, I call I call Yowie Dan and uh, Gary Lynn, I call them El Chingons. So, El Chingones. Yes, yeah, so that's that's what I call them. That's that's what does that mean? That's Spanish for the fucking badasses. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all what, right. That's what that's what I call them. But anyway, Buck, thank you so much for coming on. All right, that was uh, some great stories. I love Yahweh stories, and Sarah Bagnon was right. You're a lovely man, and we would love to have you back on. Please, anytime, and uh, I'll send you some more. Uh, photos um when i get off okay and then so you can add them to us, whatever you need send us a link for that book too and i'll add it on to the the podcast whenever i post it okay that's great thank you so much guys thank you thank you thank you robert thank you Stephen. Mm -hmm. no bye all right bye